Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's ASA webinar, Recognizing Cultural Diversity in a Service Delivery to Older Adults, part of the Empowering Professionals in Aging series presented by Home Instead Incorporated, franchisor of the Home Instead Network. My name is Julia Burroughs, Program Coordinator at the American Society on Aging, and we are so glad to have you with us. We will be getting started in just a moment, but before we do, a few housekeeping notes. The slides for today's presentation are available under the tab on your screen labeled resources. You can download them from here and you will also get them in a follow-up email after today's event. Under the tab labeled CE application here, you will find information on how to obtain CE credit for today's event. You have 60 days to complete the continuing education application and it may take up to 30 days from the date of your application for us to process and issue your CE credit. If you are not logged into this webinar directly, that is if you're watching as part of a group, then you will not be eligible for CE credit. You must use your individualized confirmation URL in order to be eligible for CE credit so that we can track your attendance. If you have any questions during today's presentation, you can send those to us at any time using the questions box, and we will save the last 10 to 15 minutes of today's program to get to those. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Lakeland Hogan Eichenberger. Thank you for being here, Lakeland. Thank you so much, Julia. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you've taken time out of your day to join us for a uh, very important topic. Today we're talking about recognizing cultural diversity and service delivery to older adults. And I am very excited to have with me two guests uh, presenters, um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about them. Um, Carolina Padilla is the founder and executive director of the Intercultural Senior Center and provides leadership for the organization's growth, vision, and community services. Carolina immigrated to the United States from Guatemala in 1992 with her husband and three children. She held leadership positions and worked as the director of the Latina Resource Center a program of Catholic charities. She developed social service programs for younger adult women in areas of basic life skills leading towards employment. Carolina also provided services for women facing domestic violence. And during this time, she realized that another segment of the population of Latino elders were underserved. That was the beginning of the Intercultural Senior Center. ISC, uh, for short, um, started services in Omaha, Nebraska in March of 2009. And since then, the center has been serving the aging population. Uh, it's been more than a decade now and will continue to do so for generations to come. And IFC is a, a testimony of the three most important philosophies that Carolina holds dear, diversity, equity, and dignity. Sorry, diversity, inclu inclusivity, and uh, dignity. Uh, and so we'll be hearing from Carolina in just a bit. We also have with us today Sarah Feltz. Uh, she's the executive director of Owlish, a nonprofit for older LGBTQ plus adults uh, through education, policy, and resource development. Um, her passion for global equity, coupled with her lifelong advocacy for the LGBTQIA2S plus community, led her to Owlish when its rapid growth necessitated a formal executive director. Sarah has 20 plus years of nonprofit and volunteer experience, as well as award-winning professional experience building programs, driving innovative thought, and uh, leading diversity, equity, and inclusion groups. She writes on culture change, futurism, and building innovate, uh, innovative and just programs. Sarah is also on the Speakers Bureau for Hummingbird Humanity, specializing in the challenges of older LGBTQ plus community. She consults with senior facing and senior adjacent organizations investing in the beginning of the DEIBJ journey. Uh, so real quick, Carolina and Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here today. Thank you, happy to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Wonderful. Well, uh, I'm going to kick things off uh, for just a few minutes and then turn it over to both Carolina and Sarah. Uh, but I wanted to start uh, with our objectives for today's presentation. We know that aging is a universal experience. 
experience, uh, but we all age differently. We all come from different cultural backgrounds. Uh, we're all diverse individuals. And so um, while many of the services that are provided to the aging population are well-intentioned, they may fail to recognize the diversity of the population that they serve. So it's important for us as people within the um, uh, aging industry, maybe you are a service provider, an aging advocate, it's important for us to learn about this important topic today so that we're ensuring that we're meeting the needs of the diverse individuals that we serve. So we're going to start by talking about those diverse needs of the aging population um, and then talk about the considerations of culturally competent organizations and steps that an organization can take to improve their cultural competency. And we'll, we'll do that throughout today's presentation and we're all, as we learn from Carol, Carolina and Sarah uh, about how their organizations have recognized the needs of the aging populations that they serve and how they're working to best to meet those needs. So um, before, again, I turn it over uh, to, to these guest speakers, I wanted to talk a little bit about the increasing diversity that we are seeing in the aging population. And as a gerontologist, um, this is really intriguing to me. We know um, that the U.S. population is aging. The number of older adults in our country, uh, in society, in the world is growing. Uh, today there's more than 46 million older adults over the age of 65, and by 2050 that number is expected to grow to almost 90 million. And it's becoming more and more diverse. Between 1999 and 2030, the, uh, the older minority population of 65 plus is projected to increase by 217%. And that's compared to an increase of 81% of the older white population. Um, and you can see on the chart on the screen, the solid red uh, part of the bar represents uh, white individuals 65 plus. Uh, and you can see that number decreases. We look at 2014, 2030 uh, projections, and then 2060 projections. And you can see that red bar uh, getting smaller. And then um, the other, um, uh, box of color growing. And so um, as the number of, of white uh, 65 and older individuals de decrease kind of in that projected growth, there is an increase uh, in those uh, various minority populations. And if, you, if you're looking at the percentages on the screen here, you'll see that the Hispanic Latino population see, uh, is the area where we see the most projected growth. Additionally, uh, the number of older uh, LGBT individuals uh, continue to increase. And it's estimated uh, that uh, in the United States, there's uh, in between 1.75 and 4 million Americans 60 and older that identify as LGBT. And I know Sarah's going to be sharing some more information on that um, population in just just a bit, but it really is important to recognize the diversity in our aging population and the growing diversity. Uh, and so on the next slide here, I have um, some of the, the terms that we often hear um, when, we, when we discuss this topic, you know, diversity and culture, and there are various aspects of diversity. You can see on the screen that it involves culture, race, ethnicity, age, gender identity, socioeconomic status, physical ability, sexual orientation, education, uh, you know, your location, maybe your rural versus urban, uh, and also includes spirituality and religion. And then when we look at culture, culture includes a number of things as well, you know, personal identification, language, thoughts, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, and institutions. Um, in addition to, you know, ethnic, racial, religion, geographic, and social groups. So, you know, on the last slide, we showed there's a growing diversity in the U.S. population, which means that we as aging professionals uh, and service providers, we must reflect on the groups of individuals that we serve within our organizations, within our private practices, to ensure that we're meeting the needs of those that we serve, because we're seeing an increase uh, in the needs of the aging population in general. Um, if you look at the aging population at 65 plus, we know that 90% of those individuals will experience one or more chronic conditions 
that require specific treatment or medical care. And when you look at the minority populations, they tend to have a higher prevalence of chronic conditions. Uh, for example, African Americans have a higher rate of the chronic condition of, of diabetes, a higher number of diagnoses in that population. We also know that 68% of people age 65 and older have a lifetime probability of becoming disabled in at least two of the activities of daily living or being cognitively impaired. And we know, uh, again, that minority populations report an elevated prevalence of disabilities when compared to the general population. And by 2050, the number of individuals using long-term care services in any setting uh, will likely double from 13 million using services in 20, 2000, uh, the year 2000 to 27 million people in 2050. So uh, when we think about the needs of the aging population, uh, we yes, we have to look at it kind of at a, as a whole, but we also need to look at uh, people as individuals, and we need to look at the uh, various um, populations that exist within that larger um, group of older adults because we need to acknowledge that there are some disparities that exist in things like health care and aging services and service utilization based on various aspects of diversity. Um, we're seeing, you know, policymakers and, and uh, programs starting to pay attention to this and make sure that they're uh, addressing the needs of the aging population. And we not only see diversity uh, increasing in, in the aging population, but in those that are caring for them, those family caregivers or care partners. Um, and family members are often the first ones, family members, loved ones, uh, to take on that care of an aging individual. Uh, and the National Alliance for Caregiving has some great information on uh, some statistics around the family caregiver, the informal, unpaid caregiving population. And this data on the slide comes from their Caregiving in the U.S. 2020 report. They also have a Caregiving in, in Diverse America report. Um, but we know that, you know, women are generally uh, more, more commonly the caregiver. But when we look at um, kind of the racial ethnic groups within the larger uh, context of caregiving, um, we see a growing number of family caregivers in minority populations. And on the slide, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a chart um, that shows the growth from, from when the, the National Alliance for Caregiving did their report in 2015 compared to their results in 2020. Uh, and, and one of uh, the groups, African-American group, um, that population, we've seen an increase, a significant increase in the number of family caregivers. Uh, we also know that ethnic minority caregivers spend more time providing care than their white counterparts. Uh, and that's significant because often when you're providing more care, there might uh, be a higher level of burden in various areas. Maybe it's emotional or physical or financial. Uh, we're also seeing um, that caregiving is more common among LGBTQ individuals than compared to cisgender or heter heterosexual adults. And so you know, we need to focus on the needs of those that caregiving population. We also see a uh, diversity of age, too, when we look at caregivers. We're seeing more members of Gen Z and millennials uh, taking on caregiving responsibilities. So uh, while we need to focus on the needs of the aging population and the diversity there, we also need to know that, you know, a one-size-fits-all approach approach for family caregivers is not going to work either because we're seeing more and more diversity within the family caregiver or care partner uh, population. And so, um, again, I just wanted to set the stage a little bit for uh, our, our discussion today. Uh, I did include a few resources here on the slide. Um, the Diverse Elder Coalition uh, it has some great resources on there. Uh, feel free to check that out, along with the Administration for Community Living. And then the U.S. Administration on Aging has a toolkit for serving diverse communities. And then if you wanted to dive deeper into some of that caregiving data, you can visit the National Alliance for Caregiving website. And so um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carolina. Uh, and I'm excited for her to share about the Intercultural Senior Center because I have really admired the work that Carolina and her team uh, have done to really uh, 
intentionally serve the needs of uh, the diverse aging population in the community. So Carolina, I will turn it over to you. Hello, and um, good morning all, and thank you so much for the introduction, Blakely. Um, it's an honor to be here and present to um, so many different people around the United States. Um, I would like to start by saying that it has been, for me, a privilege to um, be here at Intercultural Senior Center. Um, as uh, Blakely shared, we were founded in, 29, in 2009. Um, and to um, we ensure that everyone, um, making sure that everyone could fully participate in programs regardless of language, ability, income, or physical mobility. In 2019, we moved to our new location after being in the South Omaha area and moving four times. So our organization is kind of new in this new area, but that's the reason that we are continuing to grow and to serve very diverse populations. Um, our mission at ISC is to improve the dignity, quality of life, and physical well-being of seniors through advocacy, education, access to social services, and cultural enrichment activities that then benefit the entire community. Uh, the reason for our work is many seniors have physical and mental health education, mental health education, emotional, and legal needs that go unmet. They're isolated by poverty, language, cultural barriers, and transportation. Um, who, um, who we are is one of the 200 plus senior centers accredited in the National Council of Aging of uh, National Institute of Senior Centers. We are so proud to say that we're part of it. It's been in, um, so um, incredible accreditation for us has opened up opportunities and doors and to serve the very diverse population in Omaha. So um, we offer a wide range of services at no cost for two seniors. And thank you to the funding that comes from general donors. It could be foundations, private donations, and others in the community. Um, we serve anyone 50 years and older um, from Omaha and from 20 different countries. Uh, the reason the ISC is, um, offers services for 50 and above is because there's many people with different uh, barriers that um, are here in our community that they don't know how to write, how to read, how to transport themselves how to communicate with others. And ISC is offering that opportunity of education, basic education in different programs that help them to avoid that isolation that they live then on a daily basis. We have bilingual staff and community liaisons that help us to communicate with them. We have a comprehensive service model that we have in our, um, in our center. And it's about um, medical, uh, it's, it's run under th four different areas. One is case management, advocacy, the other is interpretation, and the other one is transportation. Our organization would not be available if we didn't have the, trans the transportation services. Uh, and that is because 95% of our seniors come in our own transportation. Um, under that, we have also medical services. We help seniors to get to the doctor's appointments. Uh, we also offer legal services on site. So for all those who have um, um, wanted to become citizens, for instance, we go to the process and we have the assistance of this other organization that, that, that partner with us. Um, we also care for the oral health of seniors. So we partner with other clinics to be able to provide that. In the interpretation area, we would not be able to do all that if we didn't have our interpreters. So education is as well. You know, we use uh, volunteers and interpreters to do the teaching part. Um, we also have mental health, mental health in, for individuals and mental health in, uh, in, in group settings. So they can discuss and they can share their experience from 
that they come from different different countries and what it means to be in the United States and how different it is from the home countries. But they are adapting slowly, but they're taking a chance to learn and understand how everything is around them. Housing, which is a big issue, as everybody knows, it's um, many different um, states are working very hard in uh, in the problem that we have for housing in our community is a lot of um, opportunities are coming up with affordable housing, but we are advocating very hard on ISC for housing for seniors. Um, I think it's very important and um, to respect the dignity the seniors deserve a place where to live and a place where they can enjoy and, con and continue to connect with others. So. If, like I said, uh, four areas is the case management, um, interpretation, and transportation. And case management is so essential here because it helps seniors to navigate everything else that we offer here. It also helps them to connect to other resources. Um, our center offers a full schedule of activities Monday through Friday that address other adults' mental and physical health. We provide a light breakfast, lunch, daily transportation for seniors, range of educational classes, um, wellness opportunities, and cultural enrichment. Uh, with our transportation, we do door-to-door -door service in the morning and in the after afternoon. And I would like to share that it runs just like a school setting where they pick up around 7.30 in the morning and they go back at 2 in the afternoon. But during the day, they give them a lot of opportunities to participate in all the programs and activities that we offer. With the live breakfast, we also do um, lunch for seniors and we have a partnership with the Eastern Nebraska Office on Aging. So anybody uh, is welcome to come and join. For this um, meal program, they have to be 60 and above. We, um, the, the, the people that come to us, they are in the age of 50 and above. We have a special grants to help us to offer the same meal program. Seniors also participate in art and culture. They also exercise every day. That we run uh, a lot of the vaccinations the seniors need through partnerships with different um, medical institutions. So we like to offer that on site because many times um, seniors don't have the capacity to get to the clinics or family members because they're working, they don't have the time to take their par parents to the doctors. We offer case management, interpretation, and transportation for seniors to meet different needs on-site and off-site. We do the medical appointments, the legal services, food and security, socialization, and mental health. With our food pantry, is, um, we have offered that since ISC opened, but during the pandemic, we have to pivot our, um, our services. And so be, we became, in this community, a site for uh, pantry delivery for seniors. We were getting, we were serving around 2,000 pantries um, a month to the door, to, uh, to the doorsteps of all seniors in our community. Up to today, we continue to provide the services, and our numbers run between um, 1,200 to 1,500 pantries a month, and we continue to do to the door to door service. One of the reasons is because there is a lot of seniors that have mobility problems. They have chronic diseases that don't allow them to go out. And I think it's, it's a way also to connect with them because after we do our pantry de de deliveries, many times they approach to us asking for other type of services. Support groups are very important in our organization. We do those in four different languages every month. And so groups of seniors gather and have conversations. And if any of those, and people attending those groups, there's someone that is in need to have an one-on-one -on -one service, we can provide that too. With our medical appointments, um, there were in, a, a couple years ago, we noticed that a lot of our senior population did not have a primary doctor. So we, um, uh, by having conversations with a team, 
we got to the conclusion that we needed to start to provide a family um, doctor for each one of our seniors, saying that finding a provider that could do a annual checkup on our seniors. And that has, that, that has improved so much the health of seniors that are in this program because now they have a primary doctor and if they need to be in, with a specialist, we can help them to take them to their appointments as well, helping them to understand about um, the medications. Our pantry deliveries, um, this is um, we're sharing some of the numbers um, that we have done in the last month as well as the lunch that we serve. Social services clients, and what means is that every person that comes to ISC meets with a social worker or caseworker, and we they tend to tell us what the needs are. Um, in a senior setting, we have learned that uh, it's working with a senior is not working with a young person where after they have a plan, they accomplish many things, so their goals are set and so they're ready to leave. With seniors, it's one thing after the other. It might be housing insecurity, it might be food insecurity, it might be medical attention. So there's a lot of things that are ongoing that it's very difficult for the senior not to need one. So constantly we're checking our seniors, the ones that are here, the ones that get pantries, or others, if there's anything that we can help them with. With the meals and lunch that we serve, we're trying to make sure that at least they have one hot meal a day, and the hot meal it, it has everything they need to have a nutrition meal. And with pantry deliveries, it's something different that we do uh, from others, is that because we serve very diverse populations, we try to include in those pantries food items they really enjoy. We are against um, the waste of food in our communities, so we are there, we watch for what we send to every person. So if it is for English speakers, Spanish speaker, a Karen, a Nepali, Burmese, Ukrainian, Afghan, whoever we send the pantry to, we want to make sure that we include food items they um, they are really going to enjoy and they're really going to uh, um, share, if not just with um, the person they live with, but with the family members. The population we serve live in, in, the, in the intergenerational houses. Most of them live with family members. So we always keep that in mind, that when we send our pantries, many times it's not just for one or two persons, but it's also for the families. Seniors feel so proud of themselves when they can help the family in the pantry that we provi provide. That's what gives them that opportunity. We also have volunteers, and they help us to do the weekly distribution of pantries in different houses. Our volunteers take between two to six pantries in, in, a, in a time. And so we give them um, directions on how to get there, and we communicate with seniors to get, be ready to receive their pantry. Um, we, also, um, we also have different uh, volunteers that come with, offer um, either part of our crafts or they come and do, um, they teach a class or they try to empower seniors to learn something different. We work with a lot of um, in, um, educational institutions so we have a students, they are probably in the nursing field, or in the medical field, and they come here and they um, take blood pressures, they do sugar checks. Um, we also have done on a routine, as a routine, like um, cancer prevention, and so they do um, a lot of, we have a unit that comes here that they do the screenings for um, mammograms. And so we, we try to partner with others to bring opportunities to seniors that cannot go to um, hospital for those types of testing or to the clinic for that other um, needs that they have. Um, so I, I, I hope that uh, my um, explanation about what we do with uh, at Intracultural Center was something that um, you can um, take with you and, and, um, and perhaps um, in the future you can um, check us in a different way and if you might have any other um, uh, questions that you might have in the future you know reach out to us we'll be happy to to
to provide any information or anything that we can be um, helpful to you. Uh, we're so proud to be in Omaha. We're so proud to be able to serve and help the diverse population. Um, at this moment, we're serving people from 20 different countries. Uh, our liaisons are the ones who help us to communicate with them. We have, in the moment, five liaisons. And also, as, um, as, as the community continues to grow, we see more people coming from different countries. At this moment, the seven languages that are spoken daily are um, Spanish, other than English, is Spanish, Burmese, Karen, Karini, Nepali, um, Afghan, and Ukrainian. And also, um, we have um, Wahili. Um, so it varies a little bit, but it's between seven or eight different languages that are spoken every single day. Um, so I just want to leave you with uh, by saying thank you for the opportunity. If you come to Omaha, come and visit Intercultural Senior Center. We'll be happy to show you around. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. And I will second that. The Intercultural Senior Center is a wonderful place to visit. Um, and I'm so glad that, um, Carolina, you and your team are providing these services here in Omaha. And just want to thank you for sharing. Um, I always learn something new every time I hear you uh, speak about the work that you're doing and um, just so grateful for your uh, insights and, and, and this important information as part of today's discussion. Um, and next, we're going to hear from Sarah Feltz from uh, Owlish. So Sarah, I will turn it over to you. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Feltz. I use she, hers pronouns, and I'm really so happy to be here today to discuss diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and justice in senior care with you. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to discuss Owlish and uh, how we're building this organization. Uh, and then I'm going to pivot slightly into our approach to uh, diversity and inclusion work, um, not just about LGBTQ folks, but about all intersectionalities because um, your identity is not just your LGBTQ identity. Um, I'm sure we all recognize that we are uh, the intersection of many, many different identities. So, Alish was founded in 2021. Our founder, Heather, saw the need in both senior care and the LGBTQ community for an organization to sort of support those older LGBTQ folks. The vast majority of funding in LGBTQ plus spaces goes towards young folks. Uh, which is wonderful, and I'm glad that funding is available, but our elders, over 80, have a suicide rate four times that of the national average. Uh, the National Council on Aging reports that folks in our population, 45 to 64 years old, have the highest suicide rate in 2013, so you see that statistic is a little bit older. Uh, our elders, 85 years and older, have the second highest suicide rate in our population. Um, and these stats are likely underreported by maybe 40% um, just due to um, an inability to identify when something is a suicide or an assisted suicide. Um, we created a board at Owlish in the summer of 2021. So you see we're a younger organization. We began hosting Stonewall Socials to bring older folks together with organizations from the community that serve them specifically. And another shout out to Carolina, our Stonewall Socials are held at the Intercultural Senior Center. We sponsored a bill in the Nebraska legislature in spring of 2022 to prohibit discrimination on the basis of LGBTQ plus status in senior living and senior care facilities. Uh, we did get widespread support, but it was tabled, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, in April of 2022, I personally began as the executive director. I evolved off the board into this position uh, and started with uh, a more robust community outreach, as well as uh, targeted creation of programming and resources. Our first strategic meeting is November 4th, uh, and we are creating curriculum to bring into senior living and senior care facilities. Uh, in order to help residents and team members and leaders understand and anticipate the need of older LGBTQ folks. 
we have this pretty unique opportunity to build an inclusive organization from the ground up. Um, my background in DEI was definitely a factor in me getting hired here. Our outreach is not only targeted at the sort of nominally LGBTQ plus spaces, but also at spaces where intersectional identities might be present, uh, Black, Indigenous, disabled. One of our challenges is the lack of data. No one knows how many LGBTQ plus older folks are out there, what their intersectionalities are, or where they even look for healthcare and resources. Um, as we gather this data, we'll need to be agile in our approach to the mission. So we have to respond to what actually exists rather than what we predict or think exists. Another barrier is that in the baby boomer population especially, many LGBTQ plus folks are still functionally in the closet. So how do we serve a population that might be hidden? Um, we listen. Our approach so far is that no group is too small to engage with. If we need to reach folks individually for a while, we're going to do that because uh, our LGBTQ seniors are pretty lonely and isolated, especially in Midwestern areas. Um, there's just not a lot of resources out there for them. Um, so you see here our diversity statement. It is intentionally extremely robust because this is the guiding principle of our programming. We are an equitable, not equal opportunity employer. Our hiring and retention practices are created to account for those who begin the race behind the line. Um, that might be those who have barriers for education or social support. This might look like providing a translator for interviews or conducting interviews in a space or manner that is comfortable for the candidate. For instance, a neurodivergent candidate might prefer to be in a quieter, less public space, uh, and we need to respect that, or even to be um, interviewed online. Um, we want any place that we operate in to be a safe place for team members to express dissent, uh, basically to disagree with leadership, or ask for what they need to thrive. Uh, those things that cause people to be different from each other are to be celebrated because that is what drives innovative programming and agile and inclusive strategy. And as you are probably all aware, those are the things that will drive your growth into the future. So folks are scared to enter senior communities or senior care. It isn't just loss of independence. It's a fear of how the system might treat them, how their lives and identities might be erased by like a homogenous approach to their treatment. A standardized methodology will absolutely leave the most marginalized folks behind. If caring for all seniors is your mission, you must account for the reality of their experience and the differences in need. Just a few randomly selected factors to consider, 75 to 80% of all LGBTQ older folks go back in the closet when they enter senior care. Imagine that not like you would never be able to have your pictures out of you and, and your partner or uh, you and a group of older folks at a pride parade. Um, baby boomers to Gen X to millennials, as Lakeland was showing on her chart, gets more and more and more diverse. And not only that, it gets more and more and more ready to express that diversity. As we uh, move into these uh, populations that are newer, they are more attached to the idea of I am unique, I am individual, I have these intersectionalities and identities, and if you want to appeal to that market, you will have to understand that. Uh, older Black Americans went through uh, the end of Jim Crow. They went through the hyper ghetto, which is um, sort of the concentration of Black populations in the underserved areas. Um, older Latinos so often have uh, unique mental health challenges around isolation due to language, uh, around fear of medical care, not because they are ignorant, but because they don't understand what the doctor is saying. As you saw, Carolina provides translators for those moments, and that is absolutely uh, important within your facility as well. Um, our population is more, to be, more obese and more dis more disabled as they move into uh, old age. Uh, so we have to consider that and ask ourselves, are our caregivers within the facility saying 
uh, unkind things about our uh, obese patients and our obese community members. The suicide rate is rising for older folks, and I'm sure you're all like uh, painfully aware of that. It is true that diversity programming, inclusion programming can help stem that growth. Uh, intersectionality, as I've said, is very important. It's not just that someone is black. They may also be neurodivergent. They may also be gay. Um, it's important to create a, a place where they are safe saying that. And then, of course, you have to understand the diversity in caregivers. As Lakeland's slide shows, a lot of caregivers are female or black. Um, and those kind of things are all part of your diversity programming. Here we go. So there's a lot of barriers. Um, it's a hard sell to stakeholders to get DEIBJ programming going in your facility. Uh, finances, I mean, how do we find the budget for something when we're already strained by changes in the marketplace and economy? My question to you is, can you afford not to? Can you afford to be labeled as a place for one certain type of person? Uh, maybe for some, this is absolutely acceptable, but you will also lose those folks who want to live in a vibrant and diverse community. As that population begins to swing towards Gen X and millennial seniors, you will see more and more attrition based on non-inclusive practices. Uh, operational capacity, HR, uh, training, or instructional design are not DEIBJ departments. Uh, please don't assume your already overtasked HR person can just add an entire program of culture change and constant instruction to their plates. You need to add staff to accomplish this, and you will need to schedule time for everyone to learn and talk to each other. This entire process takes time, and especially in the senior space, it is gradual. Um, it would be great if we could all be incredibly inclusive and happy right away, but that may or may not be the case. Um, simply adding a diversity statement to your website means absolutely nothing, and your retention figures and staff surveys are going to express that. Um, values change. This process takes time. You're asking your team to be vulnerable. You're asking them to change their assumptions. It's uncomfortable. Part of the DEI process is re-examining your organizational values and identifying the places in like policies, procedures, and approach to care that need to change in order to align with your values. I can guarantee you, you will be a stronger, more agile, more innovative organization with a more invested staff who want to stay and grow with you as you start to get comfortable with the conversations and changes. Surveys are a great way to measure progress because you have to measure progress. Um, part of including this kind of programming in your organization is being able to prove that it's effective. Um, just like any other part of your organization, you need to justify it to stakeholders. So surveys are one way to measure growth and advancement. These are holistic surveys across the organization, including residents, staff at every level, and members of the public. Um, and yes, you can absolutely survey people who are not in your facility yet. Um, retention figures and diversity of candidates is another way to measure whether or not the things you're doing are effective. Um, Expertise, again, HR and training are vital partners in DEIBJ work, but your initiatives need to be led by someone who understands everything I've discussed here and knows how to build programs and partnerships that will help your organization achieve longevity and growth. Um, integrating existing programs, you do not have to scrap what you already do. Most folks on this call already have things they do spectacularly well, so don't stop. DEIBJ is looking at the things you do just from an inclusivity lens. Can we add to this program so it's relevant to staff members who use English as a second language? Can we change the wording of this policy so that Black residents feel included and then train our teams on ways to express that change? DEI work is so intimidating and so sort of, it feels like it's scorched earth. Many organizations don't want to even try it, especially when you have change averse populations, but that is not financially feasible if you want to truly achieve longevity and be a leader in your space. I cannot recommend strongly enough that you hire consultants to evaluate your needs and practices and help you create a plan that achieves measurable goals. I get that it seems like an investment with questionable outcomes, but like that experienced consultant 
can do the job 10 times faster than anyone that's just pulled from a different department. They will help you understand how to work with staff who are challenged and uncomfortable with these changes. And they will help you find a DEIBJ staff member that will be able to lead your organization at the right pace and with the best understanding of your local population and your needs. So how do you begin? Oh man, you need buy-in. So talk to your HR department and leaders at every level of your team. Find out kind of what they think. How do they see the challenges that are going on in your organization? This sets the stage for cultural change and creates a team of champions who will support your initiatives and conversations and meetings. You will need to evaluate the message that your internal and external materials are giving. Are you only offering him and her as options? Are your dress code or educational requirements keeping staff from advancing? And does your mission actually support the idea of inclusion? Um, in my experience, most organizations don't really even have a mission statement. It tends to be a statement of values rather than a mission. And understand it that training is going to need to be tailored to your population and team. You know what? Your organization is unique. Even if you are, say, a network of the same type of organization, your personal shop is unique to you. So if you have managers giving trainings, do they actually believe what they're saying? Or are they subtly undercutting the message and creating that culture of mistrust? Uh, for residents, programs to help residents understand sort of your DEIBJ goals should be gradual, maybe even casual. Taco night is not an inclusivity activity, <laughs> but a cooking class taught by a local indigenous chef might be. Um, you know, the, the standard uh, example is, do you celebrate Christmas and ignore Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, and Ramadan? Um, if you have even one resident who identifies as LGBTQ or has a family member who is LGBTQ, you are creating an atmosphere of distrust if your staff is making gay jokes uh, sort of in the background or if they refuse to acknowledge pride and you have lost every referral they or their friends might make. Acknowledge sort of sensitively and with permission, the identities of the folks who are already in your community. Make sure that they understand that diversity means them too. Externally, understand that success in year one or even sort of year five might not look of ha like having the rainbow coalition of residents you would envision. Um, so create actionable and achievable goals so that your team feels accomplishment and momentum. This is what keeps programs from failure the way you speak to the larger community on social media, speaking engagements, in your advertising. There are ways to keep organizational identity, but also express your commitment to inclusion. Do you have staff that speak Spanish? Are you then advertising in Spanish so that potential residents or staff members understand that they will be understood? Are you using diverse images to express your intention? Are you being honest that you aren't there yet but that you are committed to the change. This is how you avoid being performative, which means creating a veneer of diversity with no actual change. And finally, do you participate in community events in areas or populations you have not traditionally served? Are you donating to diverse causes? Is your community service ERG tasked with looking at diverse opportunities in underserved communities? I cannot overstate the value of reputation in this work. And you build that reputation by showing up consistently and by being humble when leaders from marginalized communities call you out. So this slide is sort of a little bit more anecdotal. Um, center those diverse voices. That means your staff too. There are leaders at every level of your staff. I'm sure you all recognize that. So center the things that make them unique so that they feel important and recognized. Find your fit. Not every DEI consultant is right for you. Um, there are probably a 2,000 of them out there. Find the one that understands what you need, understands your perhaps geographic area, the kind of population you're serving. That person is going to be able to serve you and your organization in the most effective manner. Um, understand what success looks like. It's very possible that for your organization, success does not look like a Benetton ad. It's possible that for your organization, success just means really incredible retention 
or really incredible service delivery. Um, there Again, leadership at every level, do not underestimate how important folks whose voices are the loudest at any level of your organization, their buy-in is critical. Um, anticipate exhaustion. This is really exhausting work. Your DEI person on staff, the people who are supporting it, um, it's discouraging sometimes. Uh, it can be difficult to sort of maintain your mood and maintain your composure when people are saying things that are egregious to you. Um, so anticipate that your folks may need some extra support there. And lastly, create that environment for investment. Um, and by investment, I mean not just financial, although that's incredibly important. I mean also create an environment where your staff, the leadership of your organization, the people who live there even perhaps, are invested in this work. And you do that by making sure that you understand what they need, what they're afraid of, and how you're going to work with that as you move forward. So I thank you so much for your time. You are absolutely always welcome to reach out to me at Owlish. Um, we do specialize sort of in that LGBTQ older adult experience, but I can refer you to folks who specialize in other kinds of experiences, uh, as well as get you in touch with Carolina if you missed her slide, because she is absolutely vital to this work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deb. And I put all three of our emails on this last slide, so we'll keep that up here. Uh, like Sarah said, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have questions. And Sarah, thank you so much for sharing about Owlish and the work that you're doing, but also helping us all think through uh, how our various organizations can approach DEI, BJ, um, and giving us some really um, practical and practical steps and, and uh, some great thoughts for us all to consider. So I really appreciate your knowledge and expertise on this subject. So now we're going to uh, open it up for some questions. Uh, I have come up with a few that I thought we could use to get the conversation started. Um, but please, again, feel free to, to ask uh, questions if you have them. Um, and, and Sarah and Carolina, this can be for kind of both of you, uh, but my first question is, you know, services for aging adults, they occur in a variety of settings. You know, we have facility or community living, uh, we have senior centers, we have in-home care, in-home health care. Um, so from kind of your perspectives and experiences, how does the setting impact the approach to DEIBJ work? Um, and or, or does it? Uh, and if so, how? Any thoughts on that question? Carolina, maybe do you want to share your thoughts first and then we'll go to Sarah? Um, sure. Um, as, as a senior center, um, it's very intentionally intentional what we do because we understand that every senior that gets in our doors, comes from different backgrounds, different culture, different settings in life. And so in, so we provide services um, in, like I said, very intentional to diverse, diverse populations, but making sure that we bring inclusion, equity, and belonging to each other. Language barriers here is huge, but it's so, um, it really opens up your mind when when we see seniors who do not speak the same language that they try to communicate. Uh, for instance, a Spanish speaker with an English speaker, a Spanish speaker with a uh, Korean speaker. They they eat together, they participate in fitness classes together, they dance together, they do meeting together. You know, it's not necessary that we they can communicate with their own language, but I think. That's the change that we're doing, is accepting each other, because aging is for all of us. It's not just one or the other, regardless or even our um, financial stability. You know, we'll have, we're on the process, we'll go there, and just understanding that we have the same needs, I think that's what makes ISC so unique, understanding each other and making sure that everybody treats with respect and, and dignity. 
and I think that's the reason people call this their second home. I thank agree you. with that. I mean, oh, so sorry, Lakeland. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you and then ask what your thoughts were. So perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with Carolina that the most inclusive thing that exists in our lives is that we are all aging, period. Um, you don't get out of it. So my answer to the question is, you know, your mission and values stay the same in any setting. Uh, the change occurs when you consider the amount of time you have to exhibit your commitment. For instance, uh, in a home care setting, that provider may only be in the home for 30 or 40 minutes. It may be that simply being sensitive to individuals' needs uh, and their needs around identity are all they can achieve, and that's wonderful. That's all you really need. Uh, the population you're working with, uh, if your entire resident population is white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and most of your frontline staff are young and black, um, you have an opportunity to support and nurture your staff while you carefully address the racism that they're probably experiencing every day. Um, yes, it sounds terrible to say that, but we're all, I mean, everybody's a little bit racist, as they say, um, and those folks' jobs are compounded. The difficulty is compounded by that. So you do this by helping residents get to know staff members on an individual basis. You overcome bias and fear by getting to know one person, by sort of forming a connection with someone who's different. And every time you do this, the next connection is easier and you see language and attitudes change over time. Thank you so much for both of you for sharing those those thoughts and insights. And um, I, I think you both mentioned, you know, aging is universal. We're all aging, um, and that's, uh, you know, a, a part of our all of our identity. Whether you're, you know, um, in your 30s, you're aging. When you're your 40s, you're aging. From the moment we're born, we're all aging. And so I think that um, just the additional tips that you shared on that wow, were so so helpful and insightful. So thank you both for, for that. And somebody wrote in with a question that was in line with one of the questions I was planning to ask. So I'm going to jump to that one. Um, for your organizations, what, if any, have been some of the challenges that you have faced um, kind of when you were getting started or kind of along the way? And then how did you overcome those challenges? And Sarah, maybe I'll have you start and then we'll go to Carolina. Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, so Alice is still facing the challenge of reaching our population. Um, in many cases, they are closeted and sort of fragmented. Uh, so our approach is both patient and relentless. Um, it takes time, but I stay focused on the mission and I understand word of mouth will accomplish a lot as folks begin to trust us and look to us for help. Um, I certainly want to be faster, but that isn't the reality. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. And, and uh, Carolina, how about you? Any challenges that you've overcome uh, in, in the history of ISC? Um, I, I think it's people trying to avoid the um, conversations about the need of services for the aging community. Um, it, it was a huge challenge. You know, I would call presenting my idea or talking about it and people would avoid what I was trying to accomplish or funding was huge. You know, my, my, my little idea was not in the eyes of many because they could not believe that the senior population needed programs and services and attention and, and be respected. And, and so, and not be, not be the invisible people that many try to avoid, you know, it, it, it's, I always think that as we age, we, the, the younger populations, they don't understand that, but seniors become invisible. They don't want to be, people don't want them to recognize that they're there. And so I think that's one of our biggest challenges was making the, the uh, making it, um, uh, bring the attention to others that there was a need because it was not just about one group. It was about a very diverse senior population that Omaha has. And so things have changed, and I, I am so 
I'm so happy to see that. And I'm so happy to see that as time goes by, we advocate more. And people from all over come to us now and they offer, you know, their service, their time as volunteers, or, you know, as small as a contribution can come to ISC, I take it as a huge contribution. So regardless of how big or how small it is, I think that we always appreciate it about that. Thank you also, Carolina, for sharing. And I think it's, um, well, both of your organizations, both Owlish and ISC, are serving such an important need in our community. And, and while Owlish, you're, you're kind of starting out, and Carolina, you've been doing this for a, a, at least a decade now. Uh, they're both making really important impacts. And I just want to, I know we're at, at the end of our hour, so I just want to take a minute to thank you both for the work that you do uh, for the older adults that you serve. And uh, I want to thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Um, and thank everyone for joining us. Thank you Wonderful. For and yes, it has been such a pleasure listening to this conversation. As we wrap up, we just want to remind you that, again, you have 60 days to apply for CEUs for today's webinar. You will be getting that application link in the follow-up email today. In that follow-up email, you will also receive um, access to the slides from today's presentation. And always feel free to go to ASA's website to register for the next webinar. We appreciate your time and for, your, for you joining us, and we hope you will do so again soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.